<clears throat> this morning, I'm going to address a topic that has been on my mind to address now for quite a while. And uh, I entitled my sermon this morning, Time's Up. There's a story about a, pa uh, a reverend, uh, and he had a son, a little boy. It was in a small church in the Midwest somewhere, and Johnny was uh, the little son. And his father was a pastor, and one day he told the pastor, dad told the Johnny, he said that uh, a very important church a bishop is going to come to this church, there, to their church, and he's going to stay at their place. And little Johnny became very excited about the bishop that he's coming, and he said, uh, what do I get to do when the bishop comes? So the father told him, you have a very important thing to do, the most important thing. He said, that's your job. He's going to stay at our place, okay? And every morning, you'll get to go to his room and bring him his tea to the bishop. Well, um, and then Johnny says, what shall I say when I go to the room to see the bishop with the tea? And, uh, and uh, the father said, just remember to say, it's the boy, my lord. It's time to get up. And so the time came, and little Johnny was very excited. The bishop came to visit, and that morning, you know, uh, Johnny rehearsed the line all the time. He rehearsed it to be ready, and finally the time came, and so, uh, you know, a tea was given to him and on a tray, and uh, Johnny took it to the guest room. And Johnny was, you know, he knocked on the door, but once again, he was so excited, he became so excited to see the bishop and do this for him that he, all his lines got mixed up. And instead he said, it's the Lord, my boy, and your time is up. <laughs> Time's up. I'm not sure if you feel like the time on this earth is up or not. But looking at all the things that are happening today, it surely feels that way, doesn't it? It surely feels like we're very close to the second coming of Christ. Jesus spoke a lot about this time in the New Testament. There are whole chapters in the New Testament dedicated to this topic, to the sign and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Many, many chapters. Now, there is one basic thing that Jesus talks about when he talks about the time of his coming, and that is this thing that I want to, to show to you, and it's found, let's see if it works now. Okay, it works. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus was very specific about this to make sure the disciples understand that nobody knows about the second coming of Jesus, when that's going to happen. In other words, no one knows exactly when the earth, times, uh, the earth time is going to be up. Nobody knows that. However... And this is where the sermon comes from, because I hear right now among some Seventh-day Adventists, uh, it's become a very popular thing today, and this is the, what they're saying. They're saying, yes, it's true that no one knows the hour and day, because that's what the verse says here. However, Jesus said nothing about the year, so they start talking about years and trying to put a date, a year, when Jesus is going to come. We're not going to set a month and a day and an hour, but we can talk about a year. Have you heard that? It's very popular these days, this theory. And I'm scratching my head and say, how in the world do you arrive to that? That is false hermeneutics. In other words, it's a wrong biblical interpretation. This is, to me, just playing with words. That's what it's all about. When Jesus said this statement, no one knows the hour and the day, what he was doing, he was just giving us the smallest measures of time. That's all he was doing. He did not have to go on and say, nobody knows the hour, the day, the, the week, the month, the decade, etc., etc. 
Just because Jesus didn't mention it there, it doesn't mean that we have to go now and set year and, you know, and try to find what year Jesus is coming. He was trying to say that no one knows the exact time, period. So let's not try and set one. He did not have to go and say everything else. It is self-explanatory that this is talking about not knowing the exact time. Listen to what Ellen White says in Last Day Events, page 34. We are not of that class who define the what? The exact period of time. It's talking about time. Does our day, year, week fall under the category of time? Exactly. It falls under the same category. It's dealing with time. So no, we are not belonging as Adventists. We, we are not of the class that define the exact period of time that shall elapse before the coming of Jesus, the second time with power and great glory. God gives no man or woman a message that will be five years or ten years or twenty years. We don't know the year. All right, That's what she's trying to say here. Nobody, God does not give that to us before this earth's history shall close. So why are we as Seventh-day Adventists are trying to do wrong interpretation of the Bible? The Bible is very clear. When Jesus spoke that, he says no one knows exactly when the time is up. However, Jesus gave us the signs to give us some indication as to where we stand on the time continuum. And that's okay to have those signs. And the purpose of those signs is very simple. And what's the purpose of it? Jesus explains to us in Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore you also be what? Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at and what? an hour or at a time you do not expect. Look here, Jesus does not mention the day anymore. He just mentions the hour. <laughs> because that wasn't important. That wasn't the point. It wasn't the point to mention every time, you know, uh, period. Day, hour, month, etc., etc., etc. No. When he talks about these durations of time, he just talks because he says nobody knows the time. Don't try to set any dates. Don't try to even talk about years and things like that. Nobody knows that. The only purpose for the signs is for us to be ready. That's all. That's it. Be ready at all time, Jesus says. Now, the time of Christ's coming is still in the future. We know that. When we will hear Jesus saying, as recorded in Revelation 21, 6, and he says there, it is what? It is done. That's when he's coming. He's, he's going to say that. However, there is another very important time in Revelation that was announced that it was up. And we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 10. I want to talk about this time. A lot of people confuse this time in Revelation 10 with the time at the end, and at the end when Jesus is coming. Now, Many Christians miss this very important point in Revelation chapter 10. And uh, they don't understand the gravity of the times that we live in right now because they don't understand Revelation chapter 10. So let's go back there and read verse 5 and 6 only now. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand towards heaven and swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth uh, and what is in it, in it, the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more what? Delay. Now, Debbie read from King James Version. How many of you have here King James Version today? Some of you. What does it say there? There will be no longer what? Time. You see, that's an interesting thing here. So which one is right here? <laughs> This is not a correct translation here. There will be no more delay. That's not a correct translation. I'm going to show it to you. The phrase at the end of verse 6 here, there should be no longer delay, is not an accurate translation. Now, in Greek, there are two words in Greek that are translated as time. The first one is kairos. And kairos means um, a fixed point of time. That's what it means. It's a fixed point of time. The second one is the word chronos, and we recognize chronos from chronology and things like that. We have that, all right? And chronos denotes duration of time or space of time. One is fixed, just 
you know, and one is a duration of time. Guess which word is used here, a Greek word in Revelation 10, verse 6? It's chronos. It's the second one. So in Revelation 10, 6, we have the word chronos. So the phrase there, you know, will be no more delay should be translated as there shall be no longer time where the time will be up. Time's up for something, all right? And so, since the word chronos is used here in this verse, we understand it as there will be no another duration or period of time. That's it. This is the end of prophetic time. This is the end of one of these duration of times, one of the prophecies in the Bible. That's what Revelation 10, 6 talks about. And the second half of chapter 10 really helps us understand which prophecy we are talking here about. So let's look at that, all right? So in Revelation chapter 10, verse 8 to 11, we have John's experience, and we're not going to read it now, but you can read it at home. John is commissioned, and he is commanded to take that little book or the scroll and do what with it? And eat. Eat the scroll or eat the book. And it says that when he eats it, what is going to be his experience? First, it's going to be what? Sweet in his mouth, all right? And when he swallows it and goes into his stomach, what's going to happen? It's going to be bitter in his stomach. It's going to make his stomach bitter. So first it's sweet, then it's bitter, all right? So what is this all about? What, is, what are we talking here about? What is the historical fulfillment of this passage? Well, in 1830s, a lay preacher by the name William Miller started to preach the message of the second coming of Jesus based on a prophecy from the Old Testament. And you remember William Miller, and it became the Millerite movement. Uh, people start accepting this, and he calculated with others' help he calculated that Jesus is going to come when? October 22nd, 1844. And so he started preaching this message to everyone around. And what happened? People gladly accepted this message. When they accepted it, it was what? It was sweet as honey. It was a sweet message because Jesus is coming. It was sweet in their mouth. However, when Jesus did not come on October 22nd, 1844, what happened? There was a great disappointment, right? And so that message that was so sweet to them in their mouth became what? Became bitter because Jesus did not come. They experienced this great disappointment. And so this prophetic time that Willem Miller used to calculate and arrive to 1844 was, was the prophecy of Daniel 8.14, a 23-year prophecy from Daniel 8.14. So when we look at this, the time will be up in, in verse 6. What time is John talking about here? The prophecy of 2300 years. That's the time that is ending at, in 1844. That's the time that is up in Revelation 10, verse 6. And last day events, page 36, Ellen White says this, Our position has been one of waiting and watching, with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic period of, in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. And this is what she says, after this period, after the 2300-year prophecy, after 1844, uh, after this period of time, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. There's not going to be any more prophetic tracing. That's it. That's the last one. Time is up. That's the prophetic period of 2300 years. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. That's the, the historical fulfillment of this uh, prophecy here in Revelation chapter 10. Now, so what Revelation 10, 6 tells us is that after 1844, we live in the time when Jesus is ready to come. 
He can come at any time after 1844. Of course, there are more things to happen that are not described here. Those are things that are described in Revelation 13 to 19 that are happening between 1844 and the time when Jesus is coming. And we know those, and Ellen White describes them in great controversy as well. But from this point of view, from chapter 10, this is what Daniel is say, I mean, uh, John is saying here. After 1844, Jesus can come any time. That's the time we live in. Do you realize what solemn time we live in? I know a lot of us don't even think about that. Jesus can come at any time. And we are just sleeping. We are just sleeping as a church. because, And we have this message. We have this interpretation. We understand it correctly. And we as a church are not doing much about this. Now, verse 7, if this wasn't clear, John wanted to really make this uh, message come across to us that after 1844, we are living in the last days. And in verse 7, what John does, he skips everything in between. And from 1844, he jumps straight to the second coming of Jesus in, in verse 7. This is what he's saying. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, that's the seventh trumpet, when he's about to sound the mystery of God, which in this context means the plan of salvation would be finished. And what event is described, is described here? That's the second coming of Jesus. That's when the seventh angel is sounding the trumpet right before Jesus is coming. And the mystery of God in regards to who is saved and who is not, that's the plan of salvation, will be finished at that time. Because when Jesus comes, some are saved and some are not. That's the mystery that we don't know yet, who is saved and who is not, and that will be finished at the second coming of Christ. So what John is doing here, as I said, he doesn't care about what's happening in between after 1844 until the second coming of Jesus, because he's going to describe this later. To him, he wanted us to understand in chapter 10 that we, after 1844, are living in the last days. That's why he jumps straight to the second coming of Christ in the next verse. He doesn't have any transition in between. We live in the last days. Amen? We live in that solemn time. And, and sometimes I wonder if we really as Seventh-day Adventists understand the time we're living in. I really wonder. Now, going back to this bitter experience described in verses 8 to 11, we see that Revelation 10 does not end with this bitter experience, all right? In verse 11, if you go to verse 11, Revelation 10, verse 11, this is what John says. John here is representing those people who experienced the great disappointment, and he's commissioned here to do what? After he experienced the great disappointment, he's commissioned to do what? Go do what? prophesy or go preach to all the, the message that you received, the good news of the gospel. Go preach it to many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, it might seem that the great disappointment was a bad thing, and it was for many people. A lot of people got discouraged and left faith and God altogether. But... The great disappointment was also a platform from which a small group of people would start studying the Bible carefully, and that small group of people rediscovered all the truths that of the Bible that were lost during the Middle Ages. That was a platform, and, and it helped them. And now God says, now that you know those truths, do what? Go prophesy, go preach them to others. You know, as a church, we have been called to prophesy and preach those messages that we have. We have a mission to fulfill. The great disappointment served as the springboard for a greater things to come. The great disappointment was an opportunity for mission. And we as a church, we forgot and lost that mission along the way. Now think about this. Knowing that we live in the time of the end, I'd like to ask a question of you that Apostle Peter asked us in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, 11. And this is what he's saying. 
He's talking about the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. And he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, that's the question, since all these things will be dissolved, everything will be gone, everything that we're accumulating today and work so hard to accumulate, everything will be dissolved. Since everything will be gone... Peter says, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the question I'm, I, I want to ask you as a church. My question is, what kind of church we ought to be, knowing that this is all temporary, everything is going to be gone, what kind of church we ought to be? And the answer is found in verse 12. So if you go to verse 12, it says there, We ought to be a church that is looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That's what kind of people and that's what kind of church we ought to be. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists. What does the word Adventist mean? The one who is looking for or waiting for the second coming of Christ. So we have that part done. It's in our name. How about the second part? It's the ones that are looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord. Are we as a church doing anything to hasten the coming of the Lord? That's about our mission. Our name takes care of the first part. <laughs> we are the ones that are looking forward and we are eagerly waiting for the second coming. But what about the mission? What about the hastening of the second coming? You know, the time is not up yet for this earth, but it will soon be. As I said, everything that is happening today, we can see the, clum, the coming of Jesus is close. However, the Bible tells us that the time is up for something else for Christians. Apostle Paul says this in Romans 13, 11, and I love this verse. And do this, says Apostle Paul, knowing the time that now is what? It is high time to do what? To awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So what time is it, church? It's time to wake up. It is time to wake up. And let me tell you this. The time is up for us to play church today, to pretend to be Christians. The time is up for us to just attend church on Sabbath and not care about God the rest of the week. The time is up for us to live in sin and hypocrisy, having just a form of godliness. The time is up for us to pretend to love our brothers and sisters. The time is up for us to just sit on sidelines and not work for God to further his kingdom. The time is up for us to just being lukewarm, like the Laodicean church. Do we really understand the solemn times we live in today? I want to emphasize this question over and over again. Do we really, as Seventh-day Seventh -day Adventists, understand the solemn times we live in right now? Our church was born from this prophetic fulfillment but a part of that prophetic fulfillment in chapter 10 was that our church was entrusted with a mission. Not just that we are a prophetic movement, that's great, and, you know, but we have been entrusted with a mission. So the question is to you today, church, what are we doing about the mission? In the last few months, the elders of this church, together with the pastors, we were getting together and we worked on developing a strategic plan for the next five years for this church. What do we want to accomplish as a church? And part of this planning was to come up with a new mission and vision statement. All right? And I want to present to you today our new and vision statement. Mission statement and vision statement. Okay? Now, the whole idea behind this, a lot of people say, why do you need a vision statement or a mission statement? The whole idea behind this is that to have the entire church on the same page, moving in the same direction. That's why we need to have that strategic planning. That's why we need a mission and vision st statement. And we want to move in the same direction to accomplish the mandate that Jesus placed on us. 
And so this is what it's all about. But before, I'm going to give you the difference between vision and mission statements because sometimes people confuse those two. So a vision statement describes an organization's desired future outcome. So it's what you want to achieve. What's your destination? What's your goal? That's the desired outcome as a church. And the mission, uh, you know, mission statement describes how the organization will achieve the desired outcome. So you have a destination, and the mission says, how am I going to get there? All right? So that's, that's the difference. So this is the new vision statement of our church. Our vision, and I, we're going to put that on website. We're going to start putting it in the bulletin. I want our church members to get behind this vision statement. Our vision is to become a community of individuals with unwavering faith and integrity who stand boldly for truth and righteousness. Amen? Now, I know this is not a popular thing today, all right? But we wanted to emphasize the uniqueness of our church, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are called to stand up for what is right. Amen? That's what we are called to do. And this, this vision statement comes from a quote from Ellen White from Education, page, page 57. And most of you know this quote, but it's a great quote. And it says, the greatest want of the world is the ma- a want of men and women who will not be bought or sold. Men and women who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men and women who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men and women whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men and women who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. That's our calling. That's our vision. We want every member of our church to be so strong in their faith that they will stand up for what is right when they're called upon. So many of us are struggling in that area today. We are struggling. When the whole world today, even the religious world, is bending their knee and bowing to today's culture and to the pressures of the society today, we want our church, every member of our church, we want the want members that will stand up for what is right, though the heavens may fall. So how will we be accomplishing that? How can we, all of us, be so strong in our faith that when the times come to stand up, we will be able to stand up? And this is what our mission is all about. It's very simple. Our mission is to surrender to Jesus, shine for Jesus, and serve like Jesus. Amen? That's very simple. Surrender to Jesus. So why did we start that way? It's very simple. First, we want to surrender to Jesus Christ individually in our personal lives. If you are not surrendered to Jesus Christ, you'll never accomplish anything. So each of us have to start there to humble ourselves and surrender our lives to Jesus. When we do that, then we'll be able to shine for Jesus. When, what does that mean? It's, it's, it's the statement in Matthew where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You, that what Jesus is saying there, with your lives, you're an example to everyone else. But until you surrender to Christ, you're not going to be able to shine for Christ. That's where everything starts surrendering every day to the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you surrender, then you shine, then you take the next step, and then you serve like Jesus. This means that we put our faith into actions. This is the way we show our love towards God and towards others with our service. First we shine with your life, then we put our faith into actions. By being involved in the mission, we will become stronger in our faith and we'll be able to stand up for truth and righteousness. That's why we have so many weak Christians today because they're not surrendering to Christ. They're not shining for Christ and they're not serving like Christ. When we will do those things, we'll become stronger and stronger in our faith. So church, what is it going to be? Are you on board with this? Are you on board with this? We want to finish the mission so we can go home soon. Amen? Let me close with this. At a particular university, there was a rule that uh, they had. And the rule was this. If the teacher, the professor, was late 15 minutes, then the class is a walk and everybody could go home. So many universities have that. And so... um, uh, (laughs) 
and there was no penalties for missing class or anything like that. So the, the rooms in that university had clocks, the mechanical ones. You guys still remember with the minute uh, hand and the hour hand, and they mechanically tick, 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 you know, around. And so uh, some of the students discovered one very interesting thing. If they take an eraser and hit the clock, that clock, the, the, the minute hand would jump one minute. So in that particular class, the professor wasn't very punctual, and so he was always late. <clears throat> and so guess what the kids would do? They would take target practice at the clock with erasers. And after a few good hits, you know, hitting the target, the, the clock will go 15 minutes and poof, everybody walks. So, the day of the exam came, the final exam. And uh, <clears throat> the, professor, the professor came into the room quickly and passed out the test, the exam, and he says, you have one hour to complete it. And guess what he started doing next? He collected all the erasers from everybody and started taking, <laughs> practice, you know, throwing at the clock. And he hit it quite a few times, and he was able to go a whole hour. He successfully jumped the clock ahead one hour, and then he called, Time's up! And he collected all the papers. <laughs> now, this is a humorous illustration, but it makes a very good point. It seems that today, many Christians are like these students. They're trying to trick the clock to skip the class. What happens in the class? Learning. The learning. You know, but not only learning it happens in the class. Not only learning, what else happens in a class? If you're a teacher, when you're having your students in the class, what else happens in the class is that you get to know the students and the student gets to get to know you. You develop a relationship with your teacher. Also, what happens in the class, usually the teacher tells you what's going to be on the final exam, right? And so you have this relationship, you get to know the teacher, you get to know what he will be asking, kind of, you know, uh, and, and then the teacher tells you. So you have all of this relationship going, this learning opportunity, and getting to know your teacher. But the students didn't want that, they wanted to skip that, so they were tricking the clock, they were trying to skip the class. And you know what happened to them? It backfired on them. It backfired on them. Now, this type of attitude with our Christians today, we don't want to put in the effort today to do the work and learn and get to know our teacher, Jesus Christ. We just want to skip this time and go to the time of the end and when Jesus comes. But that's the important time of preparation for the final exam. If you skip this time, you are not going to be ready for the final exam. And you will be surprised and shocked and you'll be unprepared to hear Jesus saying, time's up, time's up. So friends, I want you to make sure that you put, make sure to put time into this preparation process today. Make sure you fulfill your mission here on earth so that when time's up for this earth, you'll be ready to meet Jesus. May God bless you all. Amen. For our closing hymn, um, let's sing, Work for the Night is Coming. Let's all stand. <laughs>